Hello, it's Dr. Naranicki here from the Middle East Institute at Christian Heritage College. And for our final video, and uh, well, not necessarily final video, but final reading for this semester, we are looking at Samuel Beckett's The, the End Game. Uh, I think this is an interesting note to finish on. The title of the book, The End Game, refers to the end game uh, in the game of chess, the, the final few stages where uh, the, the king may have a couple of pawns to defend itself and it's really just a matter of playing out the final situation, uh, the terminal stage in a, a game of chess. So that's where we get the, the title from. Uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, providing a brief background as to who Beckett was, uh, there's some things uh, worth noting. First of all, uh, Beckett's Irish or Gaelic ancestry uh, growing up in Ireland, I think that's crucial. Uh, it's crucial for a couple of reasons. One, from, from a stylistic reason, that the, voice, the voices of his characters tend to have a strong Irish inflection in, in, in that the emphasis is placed on every syllable uh, in, in, a, in a very sort of Gaelic uh, English type of uh, uh, way of articulating uh, and, and, and even, even well so, so at that at that level that I think that's particularly uh, uh, noteworthy um, the characters almost seem to, to, to come out with Irish accents in, the, in, a, in a way uh, and also they kind of the the the, the morose, the depressive sort of uh, air to to Beckett's works it is also a very a very Irish thing. I mean, Beckett himself notes that uh, the Irish thing ca don't care about art any more than a fart in, in their corduroys or something like that. He uh, words to that to those effects. Uh, so so. Aesthetic, aesthetic beauty is, 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 is not a, well, it, there's almost a rebellion against aesthetic beauty here. They're kind of a, 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 a dis, a, an intentional uh, a disregard for that, uh, which is keep, in, in our particular, in, in the particular Irish uh, context, that was more a matter of, of necessity, the, 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 uh, the, the social and economic um, uh, difficulties um, uh, surrounding living in, in Ireland un under English occupation uh, really made things like aesthetics uh, uh, a luxury for most people. Uh, so, so I think that that aspect also needs to be. Uh, uh, we we need to pay attention to to that. Uh, so it's it's interesting that the the the, the amount of uh, uh, well the impact that a little country like Ireland has had on modern con culture and, and, and modernism, with James Joyce and, and and Samuel Beckett particularly. Uh, so so we have so we have that context. The other important fact is that. Beckett, like Camus, went to Paris during the war. So he was one of the few few people who 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 went to who went went over to Paris during that time. So uh, so the, uh, so like Camus, we, we see a similar uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, intellectual imbued with and at home in uh, the the Parisian intellectual culture. Uh, many of Beckett's works were written in French and he found that uh, because French was a second language that he could sort of uh, uh, that the simplicity of the language in his plays uh, worked nicely with uh, uh, writing in a second language um, so so he's a complex character this Beckett like, like, a, like a lot of Irish people are on the surface of it they often seem seem to be quite quite you know quite simple and one-dimensional but they often have hidden comportments and languages and these sort of things and Becker was was one of these people that he had he 
he has a very sophisticated uh, uh, person uh, who, uh, who who played down his sophisticate in a very Irish way too. That uh, un unwilling to to want to take attention is a very very Irish thing as well, particularly in the colonial context. Uh, that you know, uh, the you know, the kind of the, the fear that the the ruling sort of uh, uh, govern, governing occupational forces might you know if as soon as you stick your head up and show off they, they might sort of cut you down to size uh, so it's a very colonial thing we see a little bit of that in, in the Australian context of the idea of chopping down tall poppies but but Beckel was very much like that he he didn't like doing interviews he he really didn't like the limelight the publicity, he was always someone who was always in the background, very modest um, sort of person. Uh, another thing also to keep in mind along with that modesty is his personal character. So we're finding that a lot of his plays such as this one are very dark and they can take the reader into a very dark place, a very dark and depressing place. So just as a way of uh, keeping it as a way of mitigating against the sort of depressive effects of that. Uh, keep in mind that Becker himself was a very humorous person. Uh, he laughed a lot. He had distinct laugh lines all around his eyes. So from an initial photo, he, he has a very unusual face. He's got the worry lines of almost like a Wittgenstein, you know, this is someone who, who's studied in Oxford or Cambridge, uh, spent a bit of time there. He has that those distinct uh, and, 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 and when you see photos of, of Baker as a, as a very young man who was always, uh, you know, uh, had, had, had this sort of serious look on his face. And so that's really etched on. Then unexpectedly, you also see the laugh lines also etched onto his face as well. And you, and you wouldn't get that from uh, necessarily from uh, the kinds of works he pr pr uh, produces. Uh, even though there is quite a bit of slapstick and humour within his works that needs to be noted. Uh, so the, the, there was a certain amount of humour uh, in, his, in his works. Uh, and he was someone who lived life to the fullest, uh, who made the most out of his life, was an, uh, was an absolute perfectionist who, uh, who, who who paid attention to the smallest details of, of his plays uh, and his and his performances? Uh, I mean, even though what's even though his his work is is, is associated with uh, reductionism and, and minimalism, reducing the play to its absolute minimum. Uh, uh, say, for instance, this play "Breath," where you just have a a. a a lady's mouth with lipstick on uh, against a black background uh, talking at the almost at the speed of speed of thought uh, so nothing else on stage just just a, a mouth uh, but the attention to to, to to detail and the constant reworking working over uh, what was characteristic of Becker even at his most minimal um, so it's interesting that we are finishing the semester on him. I mean, if we compare Beckett to, to earlier works we've looked at, say uh, Chekhov's the, the Cherry Orchard, um, we see a, a similarity here. Well, well, well not a similarity, a, a, a movement. So we can see a progression. Uh, in the Cherry Orchard, we, we see Chekhov sort of dealing with the theme of the decline or the end of a particular class or era. With Beckett, takes that a step further. We see the decline or end of an individual's life, of the life of a human. And indeed, in this particular play, with the play of the idea of the end of humanity uh, itself. So there is a progression here. Uh, so we're, we're seeing, we, we, get, we get to see a, 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 a movement. Uh, Unlike, I personally would uh, prefer the, the the plays of Chekhov because of the 
you know, the, the aesthetic aspect to them, the, the, the beauty of the sort of the, the, the descriptive environment. Uh, but with, with Becker, all that, the, there's no sort of, I, there's a rejection of, 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 of the beautiful, of um, uh, sensual sort of in, enjoyment of any sense. So unlike Camus even, uh, so he's not a sensualist like Camus, so we, we're seeing that it's, 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 it's really anything that might be mildly or even remotely sensual, Beckett sort of does away with in, in this particular play and in his plays. Um, uh, yeah. So he's trying to get a, a sort of a, you know, an, a, a visceral reaction, a reaction of disgust almost, an immediate reaction, playing on the immediacies, uh, immediacy uh, of the reaction. And, and and part of that, I say, uh, his his play "Waiting for God," uh, that famous play, uh, when it, that was first produced, in in a, in a, in, in a post for a French sort of uh, context. Well, they they very poor. They didn't really have much to to in terms of um, production value. So really, the only prop in that play was a a a tree with no branches. So the only <laughs> scene that uh, well, the only sort of surroundings or or stage set that sort of was uh, provided in that play was a uh, a dead tree, and that was created by um, uh, you know putting paper mache around coat hangers, and that was it. And then there were basically two actors, four actors in total, and um, it was a very simple, minimalistic uh, production. So really stripping back everything, stripping back the Stripping back the context of the surroundings, the room, the room, um, stripping everything back to its its uh, the bare minimum, and even in language, it's uh, the language too. Say in in this play, the end game. Notice the language is very simple and very repetitive. So that's an it moving towards this sort of the minimalism in scripting. Uh, don't be fooled by that. A lot of work and attention went into Beckett choosing the particular simple, the particular words in their simplicity. Uh, I mean, we, we, we see that. I mean, just at one stage when it, where the character of Clove mentions uh, uh, it is finished, a reference to uh, the Gospel of John. Uh, and, the, and the words of Christ. I mean, we, we, we've seen that again earlier on this semester in, in the utterances of, of those particular words in, in Tolstoy's, the death of Ivan Ilyich. Uh, so we, we, we see in, in Becker always, also uh, the impact or the, or the influence of, of, of the Gospels. In a very, in a very strange and unsuspect, suspecting way. Uh, so pay attention to that. That that uh, word, the word, the particular words and the particular wording isn't isn't an accidental matter. There's also a, a, an aspect of modernism, well, a, a crucial aspect of modernism that we've we've, we've dealt with a little bit before is, is the idea of the meta level encroaching on the uh, immediate play or the immediate work. Uh, say Virginia Woolf in which literary theory, criticism or essay criticism is embedded within the essay, a room of one's own. We see that in philosophy of science, where uh, a scientific writing also uh, includes a methodological, epistemological uh, embedded w w within that in the work of Karl Popper, uh, and a turn that science turning in on itself and becoming concerned more with uh, epistemological, methodological concerns. Uh, we see this in, 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 a, in a play as well. 
where we're not too sure whether the characters such as Han or Clove are aware of their own life as a performance uh, and the way the characters enter and exit. Uh, there's a, there's a, he's playing with the idea of, uh, the, the, the characters or awareness of, of their own being actors, uh, in, in a, in a play, and then, uh, sort of, and then, and then at the same time, leaving the end sort of open, uh, he does that in, 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 in his plays, he doesn't, Beckett doesn't stick to the conventional sort of, Closure, closure of a of of a particular play. He leaves it open, such that we we don't. I mean, uh, open to interpretation. Um, and I think this ray. And then this 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 raises an interesting reflexive insight that life, in a sense, is a performance. There's a performative aspect to life and living one's life. There's a narrative aspect to living one's life. So, so by, by, by seeing the, the actors on the stage as, as perhaps questioning whether they have a, a self-conscious realization of their own, own uh, uh, performance, uh, then, then that's turned back on the audience and the audience starting to see, well, to what extent are our lives also uh, in measure a performance and life also a kind of of stage. So ba basically, Beckett he 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 does away with all conventions. Uh, any convention, he pretty much breaks it. The, the idea of of of, of having act, acts and scenes uh, that are conventionally divided and that end in a certain way, um, that's all all done done away with uh, in 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 his works. Another thing to know is uh, there's almost like awakening at the beginning of this 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 play when uh, the sheets are, are are removed and all the characters seem to come alive and then at the end almost a a, a going to sleep again but not quite in it, 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 that there's no sort of resolution so. Uh, so I think that's that that that's also interesting. The the kind of metaphor of waking up and, and going to sleep, or uh, playing out in 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 the stage set, the props and the actors. So, however, they the character say Clove. He he never he never he never really departs. He always says he's going to go. He, he grabs his hat and jacket, but he never really goes off the stage, he never really departs, there's never that kind of final, and that's characteristic of Beckett, waiting and waiting for Godot, he never, the, the main character never makes that, that, that final uh, uh, move, movement. So, so Beckett, this is a classic work of, of absurdist theatre, uh, the um, once again, playing with with the absurd. And we looked at the absurd last week in Camus in a Camus lecture. So we're we're, we're, see, we're seeing that the absurd being brought here into in in, in in into drama. We're seeing the, the sort of black humor being used to, uh, I mean, to to deal with very diff difficult issues and very very deep existentialist issues. I mean, the, the key themes I think in Beckett are time, grief, and the self, uh, and all of those. Uh, and the human condition, Beckett notes, is, is, is really about waiting. And I think in this age of uh, immediacy and having devices that you're ready, multiple devices around, always scrolling and checking, 
by there that our civilization has lost the capacity to wait. People have lost the capacity to wait. Our brains are, are no longer structured in a way that can deal slowly with things, that can wait. And I think Beckett, he, he do, really does that in this play. He slows by the simplicity of the language and the movement. Uh, he slows everything down. We sit down waiting for Godot as well. He slows everything down. Uh, in the breath, however, he does the opposite. He, he amplifies it. So he's playing with cadences throughout his works. In, in a play breath, he's, he's working at this, almost at the stream of consciousness sort of speed. And Beckett was also very musical. So he had, when he, when he guided productions, he had a kind of, the, he played the role almost of a conductor. Uh, so he had this music, another, another hidden, hidden talent by this talented Irishman. Um, so there was something musical about his works. There's a cadence to it. Um, but in this particular play, the, the emphasis on this, is on the slowness and the slowing down and being attentive. And I think th there's a contemplative and meditative uh, value to this, that he is asking us, calling on us to be m more meditative and contemplative uh, and attentive to our, our immediate surroundings and being attentive while waiting. There's almost a mindfulness there. He was into mindfulness in a way before mindfulness became trendy. And there's all, in a strange way, there's, there's a lot of the, the medieval Irish monk about Beckett. So, take what you will, but I think that's, that's, that's crucial. After reading Beckett, you kind of become more attentive to the words you use. Uh, and you listen better. So it's not as, so it's almost a training in listening, listening to others, listening to yourself. Uh, So that's part of the, the, the I mean, non-accidental, deliberate aspect of his minimalism. They just try to draw us into focus on what very little is in the uh, particular play before us. But you notice even in this play, even where there is no uh, sort of no moralistic, didactic, moralistic sort of teaching that's overt, unlike the, uh, the Tolstoy or the, or the Chekhov or earlier plays where there's kind of an emphasis on, uh, well, the uh, uh, sort of, it's almost spelt out the moral, per, the moral, you know, uh, insight that, or moral teaching that's trying to come out. There's, the, there's no kind of, um, uh, at the overt level, at the medi at the uh, mediated level, there isn't, there is no sort of uh, central message or teaching. It's absurd and it's pointless at the mediated level. That is the the uh, the analytic, the kind of uh, argumentative uh, level. But strangely, you notice that the cadence picks up. And it amplifies and it does reach a crescendo so even in its absurd meaninglessness Becker is able does kind of ab is able towards the end to have uh, uh, a, a, to, to have almost a hum sort of uh, a, a sort of a, a, almost a, a, a central di a, a, well, a central monologue, a, a sort of uh, by by the character by the character Hum, uh, that almost that the, the sense of drama and tension builds. Uh, as 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 we lead up towards the end, where Hum, the character of Hum, is. Is, is delivering here his, um, his his final final longer sp speeches uh, that include you know very little 
little words and are, are very minimal. Uh, and you notice that in that, one of the mechanisms that Beckett does, does to create this tension, to create this in intensity, like uh, to create this sense of, okay, there's, this is a, a, an event moment within the play, uh, he creates a lot of comments, in-text comments, uh, and these in-text comments are very crucial to the reading of the play, so we have to pay attention to those as well, as well as the minimalism of of the of the particular of the particular words. Uh, so basically, yeah, I think that point is something to, to notice that even even in, in in a in a in a play that 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 that, that puts the absurd, the, the, the sense of meaninglessness to the fore, uh, of, 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 of ra the sense of randomness, uh, pointlessness, forgetting, uh, wordlessness, he still manages to create an, uh, 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 he still manages to create a, a dr dramatic in intensity and dramatic tension out of almost nothing and there's something uh this well th that is the genius of beckett that that isn't easy to do i mean it's easy uh it, it's easy if, if if you have some grand moralistic soliloquies and you know at the at the end some grand sort of uh, ideal message to the a character who's been through trials and tribulations it's easy for them to sort of uh, it's easy for for that character in, in 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 the Shakespearean tradition to be able to to utter a real profound um, uh, captivating monologue. However, uh, it's very difficult when the main character itself is in the midst of, of senility is a. Uh, is is in the, in the midst of 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 forgetting, uh, has nothing really to say, uh, but yet still Beckett manages to 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 amplify and and, and ramp up the, uh, uh, the the tension in 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 this particular play, so. That's something to, to pay attention to. Uh, so I, I, I think I'll, I'll leave this, this video there. Um, don't be fooled by the minimalism. Uh, the, the, minimal, the minimalism in this sense, in the sense of Beckett, often makes the traditional task of drama production all the, even more difficult. Uh, so I think we can see in Beckett what it means to push drama right to the very extreme of the the genre. What it take when you push the idea of a play right to its very extreme. So what are the very minimal conditions in which something still can still be described as a play or dramatic performance? So Baker takes us to that point, and then he likes to overstep it. Uh, where can drama, but then we must ask ourselves, where can drama or play or, or, uh, go after Beckett? And that's not an easy question. Once you go down the minimalist road, uh, there's not really much more, there's only so far you can go before, I mean, it's a music. Once you go down the minimalist road, then you really, uh, just have, sort of uh, absolute, you know, either have absolute silence or white noise. Uh, and saying Beckett's play Breath, so uh, where, where you have basically just a, a, <laughs> a breathing out. And that's, that's basically the whole play, the whole performance. Um, I think that's, you know that's basically i mean it, it's basically it's, it's pushing it to its absolute minimum 
How many people can do that? How many people can get away with it? Can an industry be sustained upon that? Uh, what future possibilities does it offer to former to future produce, producers? Uh, that's that's all. That's not that's not really that's not clear. So uh, those th these are questions I think we need to answer when looking at minimalist theatre. Thank you.